Hi, we we're talking about research methods and in an earlier presentation we talked about how to how to measure things through observation and self-report and we talked about several different types of procedures used to test our hypotheses, case studies, experiments, correlational findings. The final topic we need to discuss then would be uh, theoretical perspectives. Um, and in almost every case uh, a, a theory that's been developed will probably have aspects of one or more of these theoretical perspectives, although we might be tempted to say that a particular theory is purely a behavioral theory or purely a biological theory. In most cases, they're going to have elements of at least two of these perspectives. But with that caveat in mind, let's go through the five I've identified here and also recognizing there's other theoretical perspectives that we could mention as well. Motivational and emotional systems, um, the first overall category of theoretical outlooks. What motivates people? Um, what moves people to, for example, pursue goals, to join in groups, to seek leadership positions in groups? Uh, what, what moves people? Um, the theories that speak to motivational issues and also emotional issues can be, can be categorized together. After all, they both come from the same root word, which is to move. Emotions move us. Motivation moves us towards goals. And there, of course, are many classic theories that stress motivation. Uh, perhaps many people are already familiar with Abraham Maslow's classic hierarchy of needs, where he discusses the basic things people need, starting with their physiological needs, their safety needs, so they need to feel secure and safe and have freedom from fear. But the belonging need comes along next, which possibly is where it explains our desire to seek out membership in groups. And of course, we don't simply wish to belong in groups, but we wish to be accepted by those groups as well, and perhaps influence them. So groups not only meet our need to belong, but also our need for self-esteem. And lastly, self-actualization is the highest need identified by Maslow in his theory as we pursue uh, greater strengths try to transform us from the person we are at this moment to perhaps a better person, a person um, who goes beyond the basic needs and seeks after actualization needs. Behavioral theories will be our, our next one. Um, these include learning theories, uh, but also any analysis of group behavior that really focuses on behavior, the, the word behavior. It's like, what do people do in group? What are their actions within group? Uh, the example that's often mentioned is social exchange theory. It is at core a behavioral theory because like most learning theories, it argues that people are seeking rewards and that we join in groups, establish relationships with others to maximize the rewards we receive and minimize the costs uh, that we incur by establishing relationships and joining together in groups. So social exchange theory, as developed by Thibault and Kelly, generally identified these factors that influence one's overall level of commitment to the group. So how satisfied are you with within the group? It's with satisfaction being determined by that. The ratio of rewards to costs you're experiencing. Um, the quality of any alternatives uh, that, that might be available to you. So even if you're in a group that's relatively unsatisfying, if there's no other groups that you can join, uh, you will still remain committed to that group. And lastly, uh, investment side, Rust Bolt's uh, extension of this theory suggests that investments are critical. So individuals who spent a long time in a group, who've made substantial investments in it, who've incurred costs within the group, may become more committed to that group and therefore more likely to remain within that group. Another category of theories is I'm calling systems theory, but in general they all have the same character of, of not trying to be too theoretically elegant, but simply to talk about groups and organizations and even cultures and societies as systems of interrelated parts which serve some function um, and, and respond to environmental events to generally maintain themselves and to maintain their equilibrium. Within sociology, um, most of these theories would be called uh, structure function types of theories, where there are structures in place within a group which have a particular function. So for example, why are there roles within the group? 
well, there are roles within a group such as leader, and follower, because they serve certain functions that help the group deal with the problems it faces and survive across the long term. One of the typical examples of a systems approach, a structural functional approach, would be an analysis of teams as developed by, by Hackman, um, the, the late Hackman, who spent his entire life studying team. Uh, Richard Hackman identifies the input levels, the team level factors, and the environmental factors. Those are the inputs that feed into the group interaction process. And then he examined the outcomes. How well does the group perform and how satisfied are the, the members of the group? Um, Hackman always emphasized the importance of not just looking at what the group makes, but whether or not the group members prosper as a result of being within their group. Cognitive approaches are, are, are the result, of course, of the cognitive revolution in psychology, in which a, a shift occurred some 20 years ago, where prior to that, the focus was on behaviors. Um, subsequent to that, the interest rose in cognitive processes. How do people perceive and think about the world around them? Uh, so, for example, the allocation of status. How, how do members of a group recognize who they should listen to who they should follow, um, and who within their group should they not listen to and, and follow. It depends upon how they perceive those individuals and process the information. Uh, another nice example of a cognitive approach, it, it looks at the group reference effect. Uh, earlier in cognitive research, it found that uh, information that was linked to individuals was better remembered. So if, for example, people were given a list of words and asked if those words described them personally, they had a better they had better memories for the words that they felt described them personally. But the same thing happens at the group level. If given a list of words and asked to describe if they are descriptive of a group they belong to, they also have a better memory for those words. Documenting, uh, as Don Carlson did, the group reference effect. Another category of, of theories is well, just describes the biological perspective, says human beings are animals and our behavior is determined by our biology. Um, so whether or not, for example, it could be a hormonal analysis, testosterone, for example, is quite closely linked to an individual's location in a status hierarchy in the group. Um, evolutionary approaches could be considered biological models, analyses of brain functioning and its relationship um, to group behavior. Uh, here's a nice picture of a brain here, which shows the area of the brain which tends to be uh, recruited during social rejection, so that when individuals feel as though their group has not accepted them, there's a specific area of the brain which is actually associated with social pain as well as physical pain, which becomes active, uh, so that the individuals know when they're being rejected and can respond appropriately to change their behavior so they're not rejected in the future. Those are just five overall theoretical perspectives ex examining group dynamics. There are many others, um, but let's leave that for now. Our next topic, we will examine um, identity and inclusion within groups. Thanks, as always, for joining me.